You boys be quiet down there! Welcome back to PC88 Paradise, the series where we talk about classic Japanese PC games for the NEC PC88, and also discuss how they're related to other classic games that you may be familiar with. Today's video is about the PC88 version of Ease 3. Like the first two Ease games, the very first version of Ease 3 was made and developed for the PC-88, which was the main platform that Nihon Falcom was developing games for at the time. Ah, Ease 3, Wanderers from Ease, the black sheep of the series. The Zelda 2, or Castlevania 2 if you will. The series has so few missteps, but making the third game a side-scroller certainly was one of them. I am not someone who thinks that. I love Ease 3. Not only does it manage to translate the gameplay of Ease 1 and 2 into side view in a way that makes sense and still feels like an Ease game, something about this game, and Powerful Mail, really captures for me a glimpse into how great a storytelling and gameplay medium side-scrolling action RPGs can be. Like many of my favorite games of the time, I only wish that Ease 3 was much longer than the short 3-5 to five hour long adventure that it is. Like many of you, my first experience with the game was via the console ports of the early 90s, so when I first got into classic Japanese PCs in the early 2000s and saw the original version for the PC-88, the main thing that caught my attention was how bumpy the scrolling is. Why make a side view action game with four directional scrolling and so much parallax in the background for a system that's so obviously inadequate to handle it? But was my initial reaction a fair one? Was releasing this game on such an old 8-bit PC a mistake? I want to attempt to answer that question today. But first things first, let's take a look at the packaging that anxious Ease fans would have received upon purchasing this game back in 1989. Falcom leveled up their outer casing game right around this time. It looks a bit nicer to me than the first two games, and my copy seems to have held up well over the last 30 years. The back has hardly anything on it other than an illustration and four screenshots from the game. It's really obvious that these screenshots were chosen to show off the lush background graphics of the game. On the cover we have that famous quote that appeared on all the Falcom releases of the game. Well, it's famous to me anyway. In my time, I've wandered everywhere. Around this world, hope would always be there. Let's see what's inside. While my copy is mostly complete, it is missing all the flyers and promotional material that were originally included. Oh well, at least the really cool stuff is still here. This is a collection of... They're not postcards. I guess just cards with illustrations? A couple of them are actually screenshots. The included stand allows you to proudly display your favorite one in your living room for everyone to enjoy. Moving on, we have what looks like a mouse pad, but as I found out eventually with the Star Trader pad, this is intended to be a disc pad for laying your floppy disks on while playing the game. The hardbound manual is even more impressive than the ones included with the first two games. It's the largest one yet, with a staggering amount of color illustrations for the story, characters, and even every monster and item in the game. When I visited the temporary Falcom Museum in 2017, I was super excited when I got to see the original paintings for some of these on display. One other cool thing in the manual is sheet music for some of the music in the game. The game comes with five floppy disks, which consist of the scenario disk, data disks 1, 2, and 3, which is also called the opening disk, and they also included a user disk. You can create your own user disk anytime though by booting the scenario disk. The BGM here, called Dancing on the Road, was made specifically for this user disk creation screen. The user disk is a bit more complicated than the user disks for Ease 1 or 2. In Ease 3, it not only stores your saved game data, it also contains a lot of the data necessary to run the game, in order to fully take advantage of the two disk drives. For instance, the user disk contains the map screen, as well as the hub town of Redmond, whereas the individual stages are on the data disks. This minimizes the amount of disk changing you'll need to do throughout the game. You can still only hold one game save per user disk, and I noticed that saving and loading takes a bit longer in this one, which unfortunately can become a bit irksome when dying over and over again trying to beat a boss. When you're ready to boot the actual game, you insert the opening disk in Drive 1 and the user disk in Drive 2.
you'll notice that the opening of the game is in English. Surely plenty of Japanese fans had a good time trying to read all of this, but most likely this text was intended mostly for decorative purposes. You'll notice that all of the disc related messages are also in English. My favorite one is, this is not disc 3, an error message I got when I had the wrong disc inserted in drive 1. Whereas every console version of this game added some sort of opening sequence in addition to this screen with Adol walking by the columns, in the original PC-88 version this is all we get. The openings in the Genesis and SNES versions seem to be based heavily on the story in the manual. And without that manual you would never know this, but this screen also allows you to select the game's difficulty when starting a new adventure. For easy mode, press the roll down key, and for hard mode, press roll up. Pressing any other key will start the game on normal. The manual says to keep the key pressed until the game screen loads in order to make sure that your selection gets registered. Once the difficulty has been set, it can't be changed throughout the adventure. Since I'm pretty confident in my Ease 3 skills, today I'm going to try the PC-88 version on hard mode for the first time. I always choose hard for my first playthrough on all modern Ease games anyway. I mean, otherwise many of the bosses tend to go down before I even get a chance to learn their pattern at all, and that's no fun. The adventure begins in Dogi's hometown of Redmond, in the land of Felgana. The initial auto-scrolling sequence with Adol and Dogi walking through the town gives us another chance to take a good look at the bumpy parallax scrolling. Get used to it, cause this is what you get throughout the game. The screens where the background is stationary fare a bit better, but the true parallax is quite a bumpy experience. Once Dogi gets to the inn and we meet his childhood friend Elena, we can finally move Adol. Saving is pretty simple in this one, since we already created a user disk that you need to have in the drive already by this point. As in the previous games, you press F4 to save and F1 to load. Escape pauses and S brings up the status window. I or plus will bring up your inventory, which is on a single screen with your equipment like it was in Ease 1. The shift key uses items. Setting the Kana key to the locked position increases the text speed, and just like in the previous games, Caps Lock activates high speed mode. The high speed mode is similar to Ease 2, where the game seems to run as fast as it can and the speed varies greatly depending on the background complexity and number of enemies nearby. I don't want to play the game with the high speed mode turned on again like I did with Ease 2, do I? That would be crazy. Yes. Yes I do. The plot begins when we learn that monsters have suddenly appeared at the quarry, and that Edgar, who's referred to as the mayor in some versions of the game, is trapped inside. So of course Adol has no choice but to go to the quarry and investigate. At the map screen it's time to replace the opening disc with Data Disc 1 before we can visit the quarry. We'll need to do this two more times later in the game when visiting the later stages. Outside each stage we have an area with no enemies to walk through. It's mostly just a chance to show off the game's graphics and a place to restore your HP. The music here is one of the best remembered tracks of the game called Tsubasa Omotta Shone, or Winged Boy. How many of you remember playing one of the console versions of this game for the first time and having an experience that went something like this? <laughs> Back then I didn't realize right away that you need to do some leveling before you just go rushing in. I shiver to think how many people rented the SNES or Genesis version of the game and just gave up before getting anywhere. So let's kill some monsters and get some experience near the entrance for a while. Wait, I got all the way here before realizing the status screen says I'm playing on normal? Let's try this again. There we go. I must say that the music even in this original version of the game is so awesome. Love that FM synth guitar. Sounds like two magical pieces of sheet metal scraping together. I mean that in the best way possible, really. I love this stuff. So once you get a couple of level ups you can explore deeper into the quarry. You meet Elena's brother Chester for the first time and a miner who gives you a key and tells you to go back and get a sword in another room near the entrance. Here we meet the first boss of the game. There's something about the bosses in particular that really reminds me of the first two Ease games. The feeling of dealing damage, the sound when you defeat the boss and your HP gets restored. It somehow does a lot to make me feel like I'm playing the same series as the first two games. 
So we defeat the boss and get the long sword. Now we can go deeper into the quarry. I can't help but have my eyes drawn to some of the backgrounds in this game, even stationary ones like this waterfall. It looks quite beautiful for something on the PC-88, a system that doesn't even have native scrolling capabilities, let alone parallax scrolling. At the very least, these backgrounds show the amount of care that Falcom took to make sure to vary the scenery so that every part of this quarry didn't just look the same. Shortly after, we find the boss of the quarry and get the first statue of the game. These four statues will be obtained throughout the game and used to seal the end boss away at the end. So we save Edgar, and back at the town, Elena asks Adol to investigate the Ilburn's ruins, where her brother Chester has been seen lately, and so opens the second stage of the game. Again, you'll want to spend some time leveling before you explore too deep. Definitely at least on the hard difficulty setting, this tends to be a good idea. Here we meet Chester again, and he kicks us into the lava pit below the ruins. For as long as we're trapped down here, our base of operations will be this spot where healing herbs spawn endlessly so we can restore our HP. Time for some more leveling and a boss who gives us an item to harden a pit of lava, opening the way back up to the ruins. There we meet Elena again and find a secret room where we fight a dragon. This might be my favorite boss of the game. Defeating him gives us the second statue and we exit the room to find Chester ready for a fight. Elena comes and stops him though before it can begin. Back in town, Dogi says he is going away for a while to see his mentor in the Eldem Mountains, and Edgar asks us to go back to the quarry in order to find the third statue. If we go back to a door that was locked earlier in the game, one of the quarry workers lets us through. So it's time for the quarry stage part 2. There we'll fight some new stronger enemies and have fun crawling under the walkways. Crawling under the walkways. I didn't know we could do that. The boss here gives us the third statue, and back in town, Edgar says that we should visit the Eldam Mountains, since Dogi's master might know something about the statues. The mountains make for a nice looking stage, but unfortunately it's one of the shortest ones in the game and is over pretty quickly. We find the cabin of Dogi's mentor here where he allows us to rest and recover our HP. He tells us the last statue is here in the mountains, but there is a monster we'll need to defeat in order to open the way. Just a short stroll away is this harpy type boss who gives us a magic rod. This will melt the snow and open a path under the mountains where we'll fight a dragon and get the last statue. But when Chester comes looking for the statue, he and Adol get caught in a landslide, giving Chester plenty of time to tell Adol his life story. Dogi, who of course has a knack for breaking through things, comes and puts an end to this touching moment. Back in town, Dogi immediately realizes that something doesn't seem right. You can say that again, the BGM is different. Some of the townspeople have been captured and taken to Valestine Castle, and now the town is sad. Obviously, only Adol can travel to the castle in order to bring back the town's BGM. This stage was a bit difficult for me on hard mode. I especially had to be careful not to get hit by the spikes or the spears dropped by these suits of armor. The theme of Valestine Castle is another one of the best remembered tracks of the game. After beating a couple of bosses, we'll eventually come to a chapel where one of the bad guys named Garland appears dragging Elena behind him. He tells Adol to follow and opens a secret passage. It's probably a trap, but of course Adol has to move forward. Inside he finds a cell where the townspeople are being held and the entrance to the next segment of the castle, the clock tower. This part has another stationary background with an impressive amount of moving parts. Here we find the best weapon in the game. Flame Spark! We'll need to climb on gears and hitch a ride aboard these moving chains in order to get to the top. There we'll see another one of the beautiful backgrounds shown on the back of the case and fight Garland, the mastermind who has resurrected the evil demon Galbalon. After that, King McGuire of Valestine Castle admits defeat and gives you a statue which will open the entrance to Galbalon's lair. On the way out of the castle, however, Elena gets kidnapped by Galbalon. Back in town, the BGM has been restored to normal, but Adol has gotten all sad and broody after letting Elena get kidnapped. Another controversial thing about this game is how much Adol speaks. In the first two Ease games, he is pretty much a silent protagonist with no lines of dialogue. But here, all of this yellow text is Adol talking and actively carrying out conversations with the other characters. While this is not the only game where Adol has dialogue, the amount he talks here must have seemed jarring for fans in 1989.
The final stage on Gobbleon's Island is actually quite short if you know the way through, and the enemies aren't difficult if you're careful. After we get through, we'll find ourselves in the room with the columns from the opening of the game, and fight Garland again. I guess he wasn't destroyed the first time. Then we climb this cool rotating tower that's here purely for show. At the top, we come to the climax, where Chester confronts Galbalon and we find where Elena is being held. I always find it hilarious when Galbalon breaks away the platform Chester is standing on, and Chester swears that he will destroy Galbalon as it floats across the screen. Demonicus! Prepare to die! I will avenge all those who died by your hand! Dude, if there was ever a bad time to be making threats, this is it. Galbaland is kind enough to send down an elevator for Adol. Normally, I'd say that getting on a floating elevator controlled by a demon who says he wants to fight you in person would be a horrible idea, but in this case it ends up being a big mistake for Galbaland. There are two kinds of versions of Ease 3. Ones where the end boss is way too hard compared to the rest of the game, and ones where he is a total pushover. The original PC-88 version is the latter. I wondered if I should maybe go back to the town to restore my ring power or buy a healing herb before fighting him, but it wasn't necessary. He hardly puts up a fight. One interesting thing about the ending is that the text is slightly different if you finish the game on hard mode. It says that this adventure that took place when Adol was 19 is said to have been the most difficult adventure of Adol's life. Boy, I bet they regret writing that one. I mean, save some breathing room for Ease 4 through 9 and beyond. Now we know that no matter what happens at the end of Ease 10, it will never be as difficult for Adol as Ease 3 was on hard mode. Though the PC-88 version was the first, PC-98 owners only had to wait 7 days before they were given a carbon copy of the game for their PC. Three months later came the MSX2 version. This one has all the graphics redrawn for the lower resolution and palette like you would expect from an MSX port. It is really impressive how much of the backgrounds and parallax scrolling they managed to duplicate on the MSX2. However, it runs extremely slowly and there is no way to increase the speed. This footage was captured on a real MSX2 and it seems almost unplayable at times, but I can imagine that perhaps some MSX players were willing to put up with this when the game was new. This one, fortunately, has an English language patch available. Then in March of 1990, a full eight months after the original PC-88 version, the mighty X68000 version was released. Some of you might be thinking, so what? Another lazy X68000 port of a Falcom game probably done by some other developer? Well, hold on there. Ease 3 is actually the only X68000 game developed fully by Falcom themselves and designed to take full advantage of the system. This version was likely planned from the very beginning, and intended to be the premium version of the game, for those who were fortunate enough to own a Sharp X68000. This system has no issue at all running a more graphically detailed version of the game, with smooth scrolling and parallax. It's also the first version to include a revamped, more difficult end boss. The soundtrack makes heavy use of ADPCM for the percussion, and includes six new tracks that weren't in the PC-88 version. Falcom was so proud of this new version, they released a soundtrack CD for it titled Ease 3 JDK Special, in addition to the usual PC-88 soundtrack they released for each of the first three Ease games. Console ports of the game were all released in the following year, 1991. The first was for the PC Engine CD-ROM where Easebook 1 and 2 had been a huge hit just over a year earlier. Unfortunately, the English localization of this one was given a lower budget this time and it shows. By far the best thing about this version is the soundtrack, arranged again by Ryo Yonomitsu. While I love the arrangements in all of the TurboGrafx Ease games, the tracks in Ease 3 tend to be longer, and some of the best arrangements have an irresistible energy to them. Unlike the other console parts of the game, this one is strangely based on the PC-88 version rather than the X68000 version, so the end boss is very easy. Another thing here that reminds me of the PC-88 version is the bumpy parallax scrolling. Though the TurboGrafx is very different hardware from the PC-88, it's not impossible that the TurboGrafx version shares some of the same code. Or it might just be a coincidence that this version also has bumpy parallax. Very few TurboGrafx games had parallax scrolling at all until later in the system's life. At the very least, maybe the developers at Hudson looked at the PC-88 version and said, oh well, at least ours looks better than the original, and called it a day.
The SNES version was ported by Tonkin House and published by Sammy. Though it looks to be primarily based on the X68000 version, it's kind of a strange port where some liberties were taken. The music sounds good, but very different from any of the Falcom versions. And there are even a few original tracks. The end boss is also a bit unique on the SNES version and still very difficult. The next version that was released was the regular Famicom version, ported by Victor who also did the first two Ease games for Famicom. I have to admit I haven't spent much time playing this one, but it seems that all of the parallax scrolling was removed and the music sounds very similar to the other two Famicom games. Apparently it's also missing a few short segments of the game and some of the stage layouts are different. Overall it looks playable and at least the action is faster than the MSX version. This one never saw a release outside Japan, but there is an English patch available. Now we come to the Genesis version ported by Nihon Telenet. This one is the closest port of the X68000 version without any big surprises. The end boss is difficult, but like the other console releases, this version lacks adjustable difficulty. The FM soundtrack sounds kind of like a cross between the PC-88 version and the X68000 version with less PCM, so overall it sounds pretty much like what a Genesis port of Ease 3 should sound like. This is the version you should play if you want something close to the original Falcom experience on a console. Okay, so those are what I would call all the classic versions of Ease 3. What else is there? In 2005, for some reason, Taito released a weird version of Ease 3 on the PS2. This one includes many strange choices. There's a menu added to get around the town, the scrolling has been removed on many parts of the action stages, and Adol has tons of dialogue performed by a voice actor. Later the same year, Falcom themselves released something really special. The Oath and Falgana was a complete remake of the game using the E6 engine. I loved this game when it was first released and recommended it to people every chance I got. The soundtrack is also the next best arrangement after the TurboGrafx CD version, and maybe even better in some ways. I don't need to tell you to play this game if you haven't already, but if I can be forgiven for getting on my soapbox for a moment here, I have to say I find it a bit sad that newcomers to the Ease series are now typically advised to play Oath and Felgana in lieu of Ease 3. Yes, Felgana is an excellent game, but it isn't Ease 3, it's a remake. And Ease 3 is also an excellent game, still well worth playing today. Why not give maybe the Genesis or TurboGrafx version of Ease 3 a quick playthrough if you've only played Felgana? Besides, who plays through the Ease series to learn some overarching story anyway? There hardly is any. We play Ease games because they're fun. So to sum up, in 1989, an amazing game called Ease 3 was released on the PC-88. While many may prefer the overhead view gameplay of the other Ease games, Ease 3 gives a glimpse of how great the series can also work as a side-scroller. A glimpse that today feels far too short, but for the time, I have to say it was sufficiently lengthy for a PC-88 game. While the X68000 version could be considered the premium version that Falcom released shortly after, the PC-88 version was impressive in its own right. I've been playing a lot of PC-88 games lately while working on this video series, and I have to say that Ease 3 is a staggeringly beautiful and impressive PC-88 game. Perhaps even the most impressive game ever released on the platform. It's like a joke how good it is, it's so strange. And just like the previous games, even when ported to more powerful machines, the enjoyability of the gameplay still holds up. I hope you enjoyed this in-depth look at the original version of Ease 3. This is the last of the Ease games released on the PC-88, but there are still plenty of other great PC-88 games that I hope to take a look at in the future. Until then, um, Wanderers from Ease. Thanks for watching this episode. Please like, share, subscribe, and click the bell if you haven't already. This has been Mr. Jakes for PC-88 Paradise. Hope to see you back again for the next video from Basement Brothers.